So let's get started. Uh, so how to adapt to this ongoing pandemic in a way that decreases stress and increases the likelihood we can experience positive emotions and, and joy. So what I wanna do this morning is just walk you through some skills or some tips for transitioning to our ever-changing new normal. And these tips are based on CBT and DBT, more so DBT, which uh, for those of you who are not familiar are two types of evidence-based treatments. Um, we specialize at the practice. So why do we need skills? Um, we can really, I know I do, think of the period from March till now, and I've discussed this with a lot of clients, as the Super Bowl of distress tolerance, right? So what does distress tolerance mean? So I'm not lapsing into jargon if you haven't heard that term before. It's the ability to sit with intense negative emotions rather than doing something to escape them. Deficits in distress tolerance are associated with impulsivity and self-destructive behavior. Um, so from a DBT perspective, distress tolerance is a skill. If it's not in your repertoire, you can learn it. And with practice, the skill gets stronger. For many people, the pandemic is the most stressful period in their lives. I've spoken to people who've endured incredibly antagonistic prolonged divorces, cancer, bankruptcy, and this is, this is right up there. And I say that so that you can validate yourself if you're struggling dealing with this. Um, there's ongoing, so there's several reasons why it is particularly stressful. The first one up is the ongoing uncertainty. We have uncertainty about the trajectory of the pandemic, right? How long will it last? What will it look like? About when we return to work, when we can gather again and socialize, and when we can travel, to name a few. And uncertainty is a form of distress. There's also change, change in how we live, how we work, how we socialize with the approach of the holidays here in the States. There's even more change about to happen. Many people won't be with their families for the first time in decades or first time ever. Um, and another challenging factor adding to the stress of the pandemic is its duration. So we're currently in the eighth month here in New York, I'm counting from quarantine. Um, and it's predicted to continue through April, 2021. So rather than just push through this kind of grin and bear it approach, uh, we need to develop sustainable coping habits. All right, because it's not just gonna pass in two weeks. Maybe that was um, a feasible approach when we thought it was two weeks or a month, but now it's, it's more about transitioning to what is. Um, so my first skill, as we're practicing social distancing this morning by meeting virtually, right? Um, well, I basically just said this, um, rather than in person, and it's somewhat provocatively titled, is Love Your Mask, okay? Um, now, this is a personal practice of mine. You may have a strong reaction to this. Um, I would recommend you get curious then if you are having a strong reaction, what is that about? So the idea here is that rather than fixate on how uncomfortable your mask is, how great life was and various activities were without it, to focus on what your mask does for you, right? cultivate gratitude for the mask. So I like to think of my mask as my passport. It enables me to work outside my home, shop in stores, fly, go to fitness studios, all while minimizing the risk of COVID. Um, and making it, if I go all the way and love the mask, right, then I'm welcoming it and making it part of my fashion statement. Um, you may have different masks for different occasions, right? Uh, fashion masks for social distancing dinners or dates. So you may be sitting there thinking easier said than done, right? And those of you who've taken DBT or are practicing DBT with clients may recognize there are other skills involved 
in loving your mask. And the first one is radical acceptance. Radical acceptance is the acknowledgement without judgment of some aspect of reality, okay? And it's complete acceptance. That's part of why it's radical. It's heart, mind, and body, not conditional or provisional acceptance. Like I accept this provided it ends in a month. Um, and it's not approval. I wanna emphasize that. When we accept, we're accepting just the facts of the situation, not our interpretation of it, okay? So for example, there is a pandemic. I could practice radically accepting that. Um, I have to wear a mask to enter the store and that's it, not tacking on and this is a tragedy, okay? Um, or wearing a mask is an infringement of my civil liberty. That's not what we, we're doing when we're radically accepting. One other caveat is we can only accept the present and the past because the future hasn't happened yet. We can't accept it. So accepting the current situation doesn't mean resigning ourselves to the fact that it will always be this way. I think that interferes with some people's ability to radically accept. They're fearful if I accept the pandemic, I'm accepting this will always be. And we don't know what will be, right? Um, so radical acceptance decreases our distress. It's premised on this idea that a certain amount of pain in life is inevitable. And it's our refusal to accept it that creates suffering. So if we accept, we still have some pain or discomfort, but we decrease suffering, which is more prolonged and more intense than pain. All right. Um, and a related skill is half smile, right? And you may, some of you may have heard with, of this before. You may be familiar with this practice. You may be doing this. Um, half smile is acceptance with the body, acceptance of reality with the body. Um, and it's more of a serene facial expression than it is a smile. So that's somewhat of a misnomer. Um, the idea is when we refuse to accept reality, um, we cause distress and there's tension, tension in the face in particular. So to practice the half smile, the first step is to let go of tension in the face and then very gently draw the upper corners of the mouth up, All right? So it's just, it's very subtle. You may wanna experiment, experiment with it. Um, and in addition to helping us accept reality, rather than brace against it, it can also take the edge off distress. And you could half smile before you put the mask on, right? I like to practice half smiling when I wear it, particularly when I don't want to be wearing it, like when I'm running or working out. Um, and it takes the edge off of the distress for me. It has this added benefit of making us look friendlier to others when all they can see are our eyes. <laughs> Um, because you kind of smile around the eyes. One of my clients calls it smizing. That helps you understand what the half smile is. Uh, so if we apply this, we can accept the pain of wearing the mask, but decrease our suffering around it. And I should say another skill involved in loving the mask is opposite action, which is a DBT skill that we teach. Um, if I have aversion or disgust, my action urge is to avoid. If I act counter to that urge and I embrace my loving and welcoming the mask, my distress goes down. So that's another skill entailed in loving your mask. All right. So with the pandemic, we've all experienced changes in how we, how we live, how we work and how we socialize. And as I said before, the change is ongoing. So here in New York City, um, we've gone from complete lockdown to easing of restrictions and now to the tightening of restrictions. Again, closed, schools were closed, um, effective today, actually. So this can be particularly distressing. It's human nature um, 
to prefer things stay as they are if we like how they're going, right? So as a result of that, you may find yourself fighting change or bracing against it. But change is the nature of reality, right? So if we go to war with change, we will lose. So instead of fighting change, try embracing it. The first skill that's needed here is once again, radically accepting change. You don't need to love change. We're gonna just practice radically accepting, right? So it's neither good nor bad. It just is what it is. And again, to remind you, we're just simply accepting the facts of the situation, not our, the interpretations we tend to attach to change, okay? So for example, my classes are on semester, uh, excuse me, my classes this semester are online, not in person, um, rather than college is ruined, okay? There's a difference. Um, Radical acceptance of change can be challenging because there's this tendency of the minds to revert to non-acceptance, right? We go back to, this shouldn't be. I prefer things the way they were. Um, so when this happens, take note, this is human nature, um, and just turn to acceptance again. So there's this continual turning away from acceptance and then turning back to it. It's kind of like a dance. Um, and by embracing things, by embracing change, we not only decrease our distress, but we can also increase opportunities for joy and positive emotions during this period, which is super important. We need to create a reservoir of positive emotions to buffer the impact of all this negative stuff, okay? So, in other words, I can't fully enjoy outdoor dining for however long it's gonna last. It's getting very cold here. If I refuse to accept, indoor dining is not available to me, right? I'm not gonna enjoy at home workouts with equipment that I've purchased if I refuse to accept that the gym is closed and I'm trying to figure out a way to get back in there, right? So accepting change makes us more flexible, increases the likelihood we can respond effectively um, to the current reality. So it's very important to practice this and deliberately. And when you catch yourself bracing against change, turn again to acceptance. Let's see. Aha, another really important one. I have all my clients doing this. I've been doing this for 10 years. It's just so important and hopefully everyone is doing this. Practice deliberately bringing your awareness to the positive, right? Um, there's no question, there's so many negative things happening right now, but there are also positive ones. And to buffer the impact of the negative, it's important to be aware of these positive things. Uh, the problem is we all have negative biases in our thinking, in our attention, you know, this thing called negative science, that increases the likelihood we may overlook them, right? Um, Rick Hansen, who's a neuropsychologist out in California, describes our minds as like Velcro for negative information. And as a result of that, it, it takes longer for positive information to be encoded into the brain. So to make sure the positive information is encoded, that's in there, we need to practice bringing our awareness or lingering our attention on it. So one way to do this is to take a few minutes every day to write down, and I recommend writing uh, rather than typing, it just, is encoded differently in the brain when we write. Um, things that are positive. And unlike the gratitude journal or log, there's no demand to feel any particular way about this. So some of my clients prefer this to the gratitude journal. And it can be small things, like it's a sunny day, good coffee, like my view, and maybe those things are on my list every day, that's fine. Um, as well as big things. Um, more significant things in your life, but we don't want to feel like we're on a quest um, for significant things. It'd be really small. 
And the idea is <clears throat> with repetition, we're cultivating a more nuanced awareness of smaller positives in our lives. So initially this may feel like a treasure hunt for you or for your clients, but they get better at it. Um, nothing is time barred. <clears throat> so if you had a great time last weekend, that can go on your positive data log today if you're thinking about it. Um, so this practice is capitalizing on what we know about the science of neuroplasticity and the malleability of the brain, which is very exciting. So we have the capacity to rewire our brain to be less negative, right? And so by practicing this skill of deliberately bringing our awareness to what's positive, we're actually over a period of time establishing new neural networks, new pathways. I like to think of them as more positive tracks in our brain. And over time can more readily access positive thinking, right? <clears throat> you may notice if you've been practicing this for a while, you can more quickly engage in a positive reframe. Another benefit um, of this practice is that while you're actually doing it, taking note of what's positive, you do experience positive emotions. All right. So any list for coping with the pandemic will be incomplete in my view without mindfulness. Um, so I have a paraphrasing of John Kabat-Zinn's definition of mindfulness uh, very simply as non-judgmental, undivided awareness of what a present experience. Um, and I think every word in this definition is important um, because so often the case we're aware, but we're aware in a very judgmental way that kicks up negative emotions. Uh, our awareness is divided, which is the case when we multitask, right? If I'm eating lunch and checking email and reading the news all at the same time. And when we worry, the focus of our awareness is not on the present, it's on the future, right? So we think of mindfulness as a skill in DBT and we can cultivate it with practice. And the idea that some kind of mindfulness practice could be helpful is creating a haven, a bit of refuge from stress. It's very rarely the case that something catastrophic is happening in this moment, right? I'm just sitting here in my living room talking to you. That's what's happening in this moment, despite what I may be carrying on in my head. I have to drive somewhere later and I have to do this, right? Um, so cultivating the skill of anchoring in this moment, you can see how that can really decrease distress. But again, easier said than done because it's the nature of our mind to wander. We, we really need to cultivate an ability to anchor with practice. Meditation is a great way to practice mindfulness, to cultivate the skill of mindfulness. Um, but so are brief present awareness exercises. I, I wanna make this more accessible and user-friendly. If my clients have meditation practices, that's great, um, but there are definitely other ways to cultivate the skill. So if we think of Thich Nhat Hanh um, and the miracle of mindfulness, there are a lot of just present awareness exercises we can do with the definition of mindfulness as non-judgmental, undivided awareness of present experience. They're basically unlimited ways to practice anything that you're already doing in your day to day, if you do it with a different quality of awareness, whether it's making tea, drinking coffee, folding laundry, can become a mindfulness practice, okay? Um, <clears throat> you could also practice by anchoring your awareness in the senses, in sensory input. That's one of my favorite practices. What sounds do I hear? And just attending to sound. Right? not labeling the sound. And we could do this for five or 10 moments. Um, what do you see? What's coming through for you? Um, when you're in the shower, getting out of your head and practicing just anchoring in the sensory input rather than standing there and thinking and going through a to-do list. And then gradually increase the length of these practices. Um, a bunch of small practices throughout the day and have a big incremental effect. 
on someone's mood, right? On their ability to tolerate distress. There's a lot of research with um, mindfulness-based interventions and stress reduction, right? It's sort of a gold standard and research to show it's effective in treating depression and anxiety. Right? So I think the key is to find a way to practice that you're likely um, to stick with and doesn't feel uh, aversive to you because it, it just doesn't need to. There's so many ways to practice. Um, okay, my next suggestion, and these are all suggestions. Um, they're offered in the spirit of this may be helpful to you, right? But I don't definitively know. Um, but there is a practice in, in Buddhism, which is my tradition, of reframing adversity as a teacher. Aha. So rather than seeing the pandemic as this tragedy, um, although there, there's validity in that perspective, exclusively I should tack on the word, um, can we look at it also as a teacher? Um, what are the lessons that COVID quarantine and social distancing have taught me, right? What have I learned about myself? This has been a very interesting discussion I've been having with clients and with friends since March, right? Uh, so perhaps there's been an opportunity for clarification of your values or priorities. Uh, for example, if you traveled a lot before the pandemic, um, now that it's not possible, maybe you've realized a lot of your travel was distraction, right? And you were over relying on that particular form of distraction. Um, and now you've been forced to confront things about your life that you need to work on changing, right? Um, your relationships in your career and so on, right? So that's, that's really a valuable lesson. Um, I think many people have said to me, social distancing has really driven home the importance of community and social connection. And when we took it for granted, its importance wasn't so clear, right? So in a way, um, the challenge factor in being with others has really enhanced its preciousness and value, right? Um, and then we want to practice gratitude for these lessons, okay? So this sort of segues to valued action. And we talk a lot about this in DBT. Um, so the idea is when we, keep in, when we act in keeping with our values, we create meaning. So there's a opportunity to do this here rather than this is a meaningless, prolonged, unfortunate experience. I'm gonna set about to create meaning in my life despite the pandemic. Um, Creating meaning is a long-term strategy for creating positive emotions in DBT. And it's also the strategy we use to decrease vulnerability to negative ones, All right? So it's not synonymous with pleasure or enjoyment. We're investing in long-term satisfaction and reward. If we think about graduate school, there may be days you don't feel like attending, um, not every day is fun, but we're working on this because we believe our degree will enhance our long-term satisfaction and reward, okay? We also build our self-respect when we act in keeping with our values. Um, so think about setting some goals so that your values are better reflected in your life right now. Now, there's no doubt the pandemic poses challenges to this, right? So for example, if fitness is a value, what are some of the goals I could set subject to the constraints of the pandemic? Um, social connection is a value, what can I do? So there's some creativity that maybe entails here, um, but it's definitely possible, right? So valued action is a way to create meaning um, 
and creating meaning in many ways offsets uh, perceptions of meaninglessness and hopelessness um, that the pandemic has kicked up for many people, okay? Also, when we're working on goals, it's opportunities for mastery. And I'm gonna talk more about mastery in a minute, okay. Aha, so exercise. The list would also be incomplete without this. Um, so I can't overemphasize the importance of this. Um, physical exercise, there's so much data to show um, it's an effective stress management tool, right? And also effective in the treatment of anxiety and depression, right? The kicker is we need to just keep doing it. It's effective as long as we're engaged in it, right? So with the pandemic, we may need to use problem solving skills to make this happen. Um, and pre-COVID, if you had a regular fitness routine, I know I did many years standing, um, it may have been disrupted, right? Um, so again, problem solving skills are helpful here to navigate around what seem to be obstacles. Um, we have on our website, a list of online um, exercise activities. And if you're hard pressed for ideas and many of them are free, um, taking advantage of still being able to exercise outside. I know I plan to do more skiing this year if the ski resorts are open, um, more cold weather activities, which is kind of new for me, but you know, I'm trying to roll with it. Um, so if you can get outside for a, a walk, try an online class. And again, regular exercise bolsters our ability to tolerate change. Okay, gratitude, all right. That's a typo. So the idea here is that even in the midst of the most challenging situations, there are things in our lives um, and people to be grateful for. So we wanna bring our awareness to this. This is slightly different than positive data log. So we wanna set aside time every day to bring awareness, ideally writing this down. Um, I really recommend writing whenever possible rather than just sort of sitting and thinking about it because we process it differently when we write. And you may actually experience gratitude as we're writing it. Um, another way to practice gratitude, cultivating gratitude is gratitude meditation. And what you would do is link phrases to your inhalation and exhalation. We do this during teens sometimes. Um, on your inhalation, mentally or silent, repeat, silently repeating, I'm grateful. And on your exhalation, bringing your awareness to something or someone you're grateful for. Um, and I've noticed um, comparing both practices, the written gratitude journal and the meditation, qualitative differences and the things that come up for me. Um, when I meditate, uh, just to share, I'm often grateful for the breath, right? Particularly in light of COVID and my ability to breathe deeply and normally. And I, that might not come to mind when I'm writing. So I notice more physical things when I do the meditation practice. You may wanna try that out and see what comes up for you. Um, and similar to the practice of bringing our awareness to the positive, what we're doing with a regular gratitude practice, again, is capitalizing on neuropl neuroplasticity, right? We're, we're trying to rewire our brain so we can more readily access states of gratitude, right? And gratitude bolsters our ability to cope with adversity and certainly could be helpful in light of our ongoing stressors, right? During the pandemic. All right, and I don't know if I have a slide. Ah, okay. So set learning goals, okay? If you're up for it, there is research to show, and I think this is very interesting, that people who are lifelong learners tend to be more resilient. 
and respond better to adversity. And the theory is that by repeatedly encountering new challenges, taking on new subject matter, they've developed more confidence in problem solving abilities. Right? They feel they can rise to the occasion. Um, learning a new subject or an activity is a mastery experience. Right? So how we think of mastery, mastery is the experience of doing what's challenging but possible. Right? It's not the same as being masterful. So I could take violin lessons, it could be excruciating to listen to me practice, but I'm still developing mastery. And mastery is sort of an antidote to hopelessness, right? And um, makes us less vulnerable to depression, increases our confidence. So setting learning goals is a great way to cope with the pandemic. And I think this is so interesting. So even by studying things that are completely unrelated um, to the pandemic, it bolsters our ability to handle it. Um, taking a language class, interestingly enough, can translate into increased ability to transition to what's going on and handle it, cooking or dance. Um, so I would encourage you to experiment with that one as well. Um, <clears throat> And that really brings me to the end of everything. I mean, I could go on and on, but I wanted to pick some of the top ones. Um, transitioning to our ever-changing new normal is an ongoing process. So validate yourself. This is ongoing. Um, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And the skills I reviewed today are designed to make it hopefully somewhat easier um, less distressing, but also increase the likelihood of experiencing positive emotions, in including joy. Um, and thank you for joining me today. We have time for questions or comments, if there are any. You can just unmute yourself. Otherwise, we can just end. Uh, let's see. Okay, um, well, it doesn't seem that anyone has any questions. Uh, you could feel free to email me if, if you do, just reach out. Um, but thank you so much for joining me. Take care.